There it is. And welcome to the Cognitive Rampage podcast, episode 92. But for me, uh, you may even still hear the shakes in my voice as I approach the microphone for the first time in a while, which I have to admit, I'm, I'm kind of nervous. So sometimes when you just admit what's happening, you can better deal with it. So, um, you know, I been looking forward to this, you know, a long time ago, about a year and change. My wife asked me if you could have anybody on the podcast, who would it be? And I promise you, my response was Dr. Carl Hart. And I was probably two months off of Rogan and I was way into what Dr. Carl Hart was talking about uh, maybe a year or two before. But uh, I would love to keep rambling about how much this interview means to me, but more importantly, what his work is meaning to my daughter's future, uh, your children's future, etc. Uh, and I want to get directly to him. This is probably as much as I'm going to try to talk because uh, <laughs> the competence will not come from me today. Uh, so maybe I'm just getting it out now. But um, I could run down a list of all the things. I hate saying what people do um, because I think a lot of us that are out here trying to do changes or make, you know, just change things up that are groundbreaking different. We, we don't do that. We live that. And I think Dr. Carl Hart is a perfect example of living you know, what he is, He's being a neuroscientist, addiction expert author of the higher price he speaks all over the country all over the world about drug laws counterintuitive thinking challenging beliefs about race poverty and drugs uh the list goes on and on he is the teacher to the doctors that are talking to people uh as i heard him actually i'm pulling that from his own quote testifying down here in the state of florida one time uh fighting the powers that be but um uh dr carl hart thank you so much uh welcome to the cognitive rampage and uh you know, let my dream come true today, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Adam. I'm happy to be here, man. Um, I hope I can live up to your introduction. <laughs> well, I, I generally like to ask, you know, the guests, you know, what they do, because in the most part, it's in your heart, really, of why you do what you do, why you chase the avenues that you do. But, uh, you know, for me, I, I like to kind of learn before you start dropping all this competence and, uh, and wisdom I've been itching to find out i'd i like to kind of learn you know where you came from and i i mean the stories that really influenced you to kind of make you you know where you are today you know what are, what's the epigenetic influence along your journey of life that brought you all the way to i don't know this kind of change maker well that's a big question you know as you talked about i, I wrote the book high price and then high price i tried to describe some of these things but you know um and about a month i'll be 50 and so that's a long journey. Um, and, you know, some of this, as we think about some of the stories, uh, born in 1966, grew up in Miami in the 70s and the 1980s. And we think about some of the things that were going on in the country, particularly in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, a lot of sort of injustice. I mean, today we think about um, police brutality, the killings and those sorts of things. And um, but these kinds of things formed the kind of backdrop of my own development. And I was in the U.S. military. I was a police officer in the military for a while, did other things in the military as well. So you see, so I've seen all of those kinds of things. I think about the military. Uh, I served in the military overseas where uh, when you serve overseas in the military, uh, uh, we are Americans first. All of us are kind of like Americans first. And whether you black, Asian, white, uh, Hispanic, whatever you are, we're all kind of American first. But when you come to the United States, it's different. Um, um, and so you see all of these inconsistencies where in the United States, uh, uh, race really matters. All these things really matter. Uh, in the military overseas, they, uh, they, they certainly matter, but not to the same extent. And we were Americans first. And so when you're treated like an American first, and then you treat it like a nigga second when you're in the United States, it's all of these kind of shape who you become. And then you, and then also I study science and, and you think about, um, and science, the only thing that really matters is the evidence and, you know, the best evidence wins and everything is open for interrogation. Uh, you think about all of these kinds of things. Well, if everything's open for interrogation and you're a scientist, that means that our politics and our policies, all of these things are open for interrogation. And so that's kind of where I, that's kind of helps to form the person I become. And then I haven't even talked about all the heroes and sheroes and all those people who influenced me. Um, but there's a long list of people. 
Um, and, and so I'm just trying to live up to um, what I thought the country was all about. Um, that's evidence wins and we treat people fairly, justly, uh, and we look out for each other. Those are the kinds of things that I, I kind of believed that as a kid and I still believe that and I'm still working towards that. You know, how, how much, because I know a little bit about where you come from. I'm born and raised in Orlando, a little town called Pine Hills I was born in and raised in Okoy. And, you know, I'm familiar with much and much of Miami and, and where you come from. And was there a time, I too played around in the streets in a place I shouldn't, you know, regress and, repress and anger, et cetera, but a different environment, though, than what Miami presented. And was there a one particular story maybe that kind of hit you where you stopped maybe that night, that moment, you're like, holy shit, something, I, something's got to be different. Something's got to change here. Or, uh, I mean, any story like that? Well, you know, there were a number of stories, but I, I mean, we can think about some big ones. Um, I don't know if you remember the case of Arthur McDuffie. Arthur McDuffie was a former Marine um, and he was chased by the police on his motorcycle one night and and um, he crashed. The report, initial reports was that he crashed and killed himself. But then when the coroner report came out, that it was discovered that the police beat him to death because he had like footprints on his skull and, the, and there was some horrific sort of acts that had occurred uh, that caused his death. And when the coroner report was released, the city erupted because of the sort of, uh, there were Cuban white police that uh, were involved and uh, we had the riots of 1980 in, in Miami. And so that was one of those things that, uh, that's memorable. Um, um, and, um, and the police, and the police, uh, all of them, were they they got off they didn't do any time um and and so those sorts of things you you know you remember uh because it seems so unjust yeah like there's there's almost no trust from the powers that are supposed to be the trusted from the beginning and almost when you witness that most of your life that those that maybe should or supposed to etc don't it becomes very hard not to just have to question everything or every bit of authority or even self you know what and what we choose to do yeah, you know, there are a number of ways that one can respond to these things, because certainly growing up, we, we, I was certainly taught that, uh, to be distrustful of the power structure, and the power structure was primarily white uh, and Cuban in Miami at the time, and we grew up to be distrustful of that. Now, people can respond in a wide range of ways, and people certainly respond in a wide range of ways. Some people act out and they they may commit crimes so some people give up some people so there's a wide range of ways that you can respond um, fortunately for me I, I try to respond by making the system more just calling out bullshit where bullshit's at uh, trying to be a good model for uh, people who are watching um, in terms of making the country live up to our ideals yeah I'm you were a game changer, you know, for me. So what I'm asking, you know, for stories are those game changing, you know, those ones that you know, change the game because me learning about you or hearing about what you were talking or just the way you were talking, those moments are game changers in my life. Studying at the time to be a counselor, working in addiction, et cetera. And then hearing going, wait a minute, that, well, th this you're saying that this is the best mind in all of <laughs> neuropsychology and this is it. And this is what he's saying. It blew my mind to see that. And so, I mean, were you kind of buck the system no matter what? I need to change and help from day one. Was that part of entering into the uh, Air Force or Navy, et cetera? No, you know, I don't know. I, I certainly didn't. I, I don't go into places trying to, like, buck the system. That's not what it's about. The, what it's about is trying to get at truth. That's it. The problem is uh, what happens or where it appears that one bucks the system is when the system is not living up to the ideals and trying to get the best available information and living and, and adjusting their position accordingly. That's where it appears that someone like me bucks the system. But really, I mean, I, I mean, we can get into the whole drug discussion. We can get into the whole sort of science and the science of drugs, and we'll start to see how people uh, who supposedly are searching for truth, they really are not. 
they're looking out for their pockets first and their reputations and their name and those sorts of things. But when we realize it's not about me, it's, the, it's about the truth, you will start to see you know, some of our heroes fall. Some of the people who we look up to in science, they fall. Um, they don't, they, they, they're not living up to these sort of ideals because we have egos. And, and that's, uh, we, we, we learn that people put their egos before they put uh, society or, uh, or or the best information. Uh, keep, man, keep rampage. I'm sorry. You, I'm all I'm all student today, man. So I'm you're just catching me in a rampage. You know, I, I think back. You were um, you mentioned on an interview. I wish I'd give credit, but you said that look, if you're going to start telling the truth, expect not to be liked. You know, <laughs> extremely. And but that was all inspiring to me. That pushed me to start telling the truth about what I was learning from sources such as yourself and Gabor Mate, et cetera, and kind of pushing that forward. And, you know, excuse the general term of bucking the system, because that kind of what it felt like to me, you know, by saying, wait, this rehab racket, this is rigged wrong. We're, this is chemical incarceration. I, I This is wrong. And, you know, almost being blacklisted like that in a heartbeat, you know, but if you even speak the truth and you've managed to kind of push that and. Is that kind of been the call on this, that wave of study toward Columbia, toward the research? Is that all linked together? Well, you know, um, frankly, I'm just trying to live a life where uh, I'm being honest, particularly a public life where I'm being honest about what I do. I think about my children and I think about them looking at my life later when I'm no longer here. And I'm just trying to set an example, a model for them to live um, uh, uh, an, an honest life. Uh, and uh, when, uh, particularly as it relates to their profession and what they do. Um, and that's all I'm trying to do. And um, uh, when, you, when I do it in my field, a uh, field of drugs, studying drugs, neuroscience, and those sorts of things, um, it turns out that, um, uh, that's not politically expedient. Um, I didn't, you know, that wasn't what I thought. I didn't, I, I thought that, that we were all searching for truth. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the past several years, I realized that that's not the case. And then when I realized that's not the case and that people wanted to um, uh, silence me or they, they want, uh, they want to make sure my perspective is not in the public domain, uh, then it's just like, no, I'm a fighter too. And so when you get me fighting, um, uh, more power to you because you were in trouble at that point. Uh, uh, you know, uh, having grown up in a place like uh, Miami where we were resource, resource poor and in the hood and those sorts of things, we, we fought, that's what we do. Uh, and that's okay too. And, and I'm happy to get down and fight at any level. I mean, I, that's what I do. Uh, and I'm also happy too to be wrong. You know, I don't want to be wrong, but I'm happy to acknowledge when I'm wrong, when the evidence shows me that I'm wrong. And I'm happy to change my position according to the evidence. And I'm happy to um, uh, admit that I'm wrong. That's okay. I mean, that's how we get better. Uh, and, and so when I don't have that kind of humility, then I'm in trouble. I, I relate to you uh, in, a, in a small bit, not on that level at all. But when I got into counseling, you know, for me, it was about trying to come and help. I thought we're all here to get everybody better. And then walking in going, oh, my God, you know, and looking at the, the oh, it, it blew me back for me. It was hard not to fight almost at that point. It was hard not to. I don't know. It was almost tougher to keep silent than it was to not say what I saw or what I thought needed to change, you know, and, and inspired. And that leading into where do you start with the changing of the education? I mean, drugs, I know, are su such a general word again, but where, where do we start with that re-education or something? So we're talking about drugs. It's quite simple. Um, uh, we think about one of the things that we have to do is not think about nicotine or alcohol is different from drugs. They're all drugs and caffeine, they're all drugs. So if we can think about all of these things in, in, in that way, that's uh, uh, so when my kids understand that they take caffeine in their cough, in their uh, sodas or what have you, um, they also understand that uh, cocaine is a stimulant and it could be used in a similar sort of way. Uh, but uh, we typically use cocaine um, 
differently because of its uh, legality. Uh, uh, and, and so we have to understand, number one, that all of these things are drugs. Uh, number two, uh, we have to understand that they're potentially harmful. That's a, we have to understand that there are potentially uh, 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 mechanisms or uh, uh, tools to enhance pleasure. All of these kinds of things we have to understand. And we have to understand it in a dispassionate sort of way. It's just a matter of fact. Um, just like uh, we understand that sex could be used for, um, that people can get in trouble with sex. People have to understand that we can get in trouble with our automobiles, all of these things, but it's not, we don't have this sort of emotional response to uh, driving an automobile. The same should be true with when we think about drug use. Um, uh, when we start to have these sort of emotional responses, we've lost. Uh, and and it, it decreases the likelihood of us being able to have a rational approach to dealing with all of these things from automobiles to drugs to sex, all of these things. And, and so um, you know, one of the things that has happened in the country in science as well uh, with drugs is that we have these uh, sort of emotional responses to dealing with drugs and we shouldn't. Yeah, well, a lot of things become emotional these days, you know, with social media, the connections, a few stories come out, they link it, they demonize it. You know, we, we seem to always need to have a target or have something to blame for what's happening in some fashion. And, you know, the drugs itself has been that kind of target. You speak a lot about that. So, I mean, I, I can't remember the comedian, but he said we tried to teach sex abstinence and look how well that worked. Yeah, I don't know who tried to teach sex as abstinent, but that was, um, that's some stupid shit. I mean, people understand, you know, this is a sort of human behavior. And not only that, it's quite pleasurable when done, you know, with people you love and those sorts of things. And I mean, so sex, trying to ban sex is, uh, I, I just don't, uh, the people who try to do that, uh, uh, are not really worth our time. I mean, really. And but no one is trying to do that today so much. And the same is true with drugs. The people who try to do that is equally stupid, um, uh, because people will engage in this behavior they have since humans uh, walked the earth. Now, the thing that we can do is give people good information and try to control it. In, a w in ways in such that people decrease that we decrease the likelihood of people harming themselves. We certainly have done that with driving and we certainly have done that with sex. Same should be true with drugs. Yeah, I mean, you saw a huge effort across the country to slow down cigarette smoking for teens and the youth. And by using the education, I mean, that that really did change, it. you know, by bringing in the education, by teaching it on, on a real basis, maybe. Um, so when you talk about I mean, is addiction then something somebody then acquires or is or, right? I mean, is it just a natural human thing? I mean, we're, we ha we're all addicted to some Is this too general? Yeah, so when we, when we talk about drugs and then we go to the addiction frame, uh, that's a mistake because the vast majority of people who engage in this behavior, drug taking behavior don't have a problem. 80 to 90 percent of the people don't have a problem. Great. That's so we should understand that we shouldn't be trapped in the addiction frame. Now, if we are concerned about those people who have a problem, great, we'll focus on those people, um, but not think of it in terms of a drug problem. Because if the vast majority of the people who use this particular drug don't have a problem, then we can't blame the drug. Now, that means that we have to give those people who have a problem a careful assessment to figure out what's going on in their life, what's going on with them um, to cause them to overindulge. Now that requires a lot of work. That's hard work. You have to really uh, systematically evaluate and analyze what's happening with those people. I mean, some people become addicted for they have co-occurring psychiatric illnesses. They're, they may be trying to treat those co-occurring psychiatric illnesses. They may also have co-occurring uh, physical illnesses, pain, what have you. 
they uh, may, they uh, may uh, uh, we think about addiction, about addiction, addiction the criteria, the criteria for addiction or symptoms, they have they are large they have largely to do with people's inability to temper their behavior in specific domains, uh, responsibility skills, those sorts of things. We may have to teach people how to temper their behaviors in certain domains. That's not an easy thing to do, and that's not a trivial thing to do, but we have acted as if it's trivial or it's easy, but it's difficult. Other times, people, when, when they overindulge in drug use, it might be the best available option for them. So we might want to think about what other options do those people have in their lives. So there are a variety of reasons why people meet criteria for addiction. Our job is to figure out what's going on with that individual person. Uh, and not to have this one shoe fits all, and not certainly to blame the drug and focus on the drug that they just happen to be using. Because that drug that they're using uh, might be uh, because it's the most available drug to them. And it could have been some other drug if they were in another society or what have you. So uh, I think that um, uh, we can be smarter about the way that we treat the folks who actually meet criteria for addiction uh, without actually having to vilify some drug. Yeah, I, I would agree. I like the way you pointed out the one size fits all because currently dumping all these billions of dollars into mental health, you know, treatment, et cetera. I, I talk about how they're just dumping them into more corrupt systems that are still scheduled on the same, you know, AK Florida model routine of, you know, an opiate for an opiate and 30 days in and 45 out. I mean, it, they're just dumping more money into a broken system and you, you know, we understand that there's so many ways, right. That, that create the addiction to get into it, but yet we continue to apply, you know, the, the cookie cutter steps where there's the 12 steps. This is the only way abstinence is the only key, which I think sometimes kind of forces, you know, uh, guilt, regret, shame, you know, rushes of it, but I'm seeing a lot more, um, treatment going down using uh, brain imaging, using mapping, et cetera. Can you kind of bring me up to date, if you will, on where we are on the cusp of diagnosing with, with neuroactivity, et cetera? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm novice there. Yeah. Well, um, so too is the field and the people who study this. Um, uh, first of all, uh, if somebody is looking for uh, or somebody is stating publicly that brain, they have some sort of footprint uh, for the addicted person by looking at their brain. They are telling you a bunch of bullshit. That's just simply, we are not there yet. There is no biological, certainly no brain uh, uh, structure or biomarker bio for addiction. There, there are none. Um, and, and I think that science certainly should uh, continue to look for those sorts of things, but we are nowhere near that. And one of the things that, I, that, that really frustrates me is the irresponsibility uh, or the irresponsible behavior in which um, uh, many in, the, well, the sort of major message coming from the National Institute on Drug Abuse is this notion of there, there is this sort of neurobio marker of addiction and by looking at someone's uh, brain imaging. Uh, uh, I challenge anybody to show me a paper uh, that has come close to having some sort of neural marker of addiction. And there are absolutely none. And I look and I have written papers uh, looking for this sort of thing. Um, and there's, there's nothing close to it. Um, now, that does not mean that we as a country, as a science, shouldn't continue to look. We certainly should. But there are better sort of markers that uh, uh, provide more information and more help to the people who may be suffering. And some of those I kind of laid out, co-occurring psychiatric illnesses, making sure people have better alternatives. Uh, make sure people understand uh, and, uh, responsibility skills, learning how to temper their behaviors in certain domains, teaching people these sort of, sort of skills, far more effective than any neural marker that we have ever identified. Um, uh, when I watch sort of popular uh, presentations on what drugs do, like cocaine, oh, you get this flood of dopamine and you, it's such, that's some of the biggest bullshit. Uh, it is true 
that a drug like cocaine increases dopamine. That's a fact. But it's also true that me doing this, me movement, increased dopamine. It's also true that when we engage in sexual intercourse, that increases dopamine. It, um, uh, but when you try, for example, as we have done, and we've done in science for a long time, try, for example, to uh, block dopamine exclusively, like even lesion dopamine regions in the rat brain. And, and, and see if that disrupts something like cocaine self-administration. It does, but self-administration returns before the dopamine tone returns. Tells you that there are far other, there are other mechanisms involved, but we've kind of narrowed it down just to dopamine in this sort of popular presentation. And it's an overly simplistic view and it causes harm to the public because you hear people start to talk about Oh, I have this neurochemical imbalance, or my dopamine is this. I, I there is virtually a lot about the opiate receptor and the response to this, uh, and whether it's alcohol or any other drug. Yeah, I'm sorry. What about the opiate receptor? I didn't catch that. You would you, the depth. That's about as far as I could give you. Is as hearing about an opiate receptor response in a smaller percentage oh. of the so-called addict population, or something. Is this hold water at all? Uh, as I said, there is no neurobiomarker for addiction. Um, um, we have, we are not, we haven't, uh, we're not that far along. Wow. Oh man, you're, you're killing me. So, wow. So advertising are coming on ways of being able to diagnose any mental disorder. I mean, be that depression, anxiety, does our brain mapping go this far, at least being able to point out mental health disorders possibly? Again, as we think about psychiatric illnesses in general, um, there are no cures, and there are, and in part because this sort of our neurochemical sort of theories about this thing are, in, are inadequate. In fact, when we think about uh, mood disorder, we think about the theory underlying, the major theory underlying mood. It's really the monoamine theory of mood regulation. That is, lower levels of dopamine, neuropinephrine, serotonin causes depression, or that's a sort of simplistic view or way of looking at that. that. But that's still the major sort of theory that guides our treatment for depression. It guides how we think about drug abuse. It, it guides uh, uh, how we think about schizophrenia, all of these sorts of things. Now, that theory was developed in about 1967. Uh, and at that time, we had about six neurotransmitters um, that we had, we had identified about six of them. And today, we have identified over 100. Oh. And, that, and that theory has not appreciably been updated. I mean, it's been updated slightly, but not appreciably. Uh, but it just, I hope it gives people an understanding of how um, outdated it is and how inadequate it is because as we think about we think about treating depression we think about all of these sorts of things um, that's where the sort of the drug development they all go based on that theory and um well the and, antidepressants are developed to adjust dopamine levels even you know don't they even treat um uh, like bipolar or unipolar even with drugs and medications that affect directly the, the same ideas right yeah, sure. That's what I mean. The, the, the theory of mood regulation that's is based on um, those neurotransmitters and drug development is based on that theory. So, yes. Um, uh, and well, I mean, the, the, the depression thing is kind of, kind of controversial because, um, uh, you know, people have done these large reviews and they reported things like um, antidepressants work as well as placebo when you really look at all of the data. And then some people have reported that, well, uh, for people who are severely depressed, uh, and that's a small minority of, of people who are on these medications, um, they work for people who are severely depressed. But for the vast majority who are taking these medications, they work about as well as placebo. Oh, my word. I mean, that's pushing the whole side. I mean, when you see the increased campaigns of a mental health awareness right behind that, you just see more clinics open up preaching the same shit, which is trade your your synthetic drug on the street for our synthetic drug here. 
let's make a trade insurance will cover it and uh go to the same places with the same people talking about the same things because you have a disease yeah you know on the one hand one of the uh, uh as we think about these drugs and we think about people uh, getting prescriptions from physicians and so forth, on the, on the one hand, I could say that, well, at least they are under the care of a physician. So they're watching them take their meds. And, and so that's, that's, that's better at some level because it decreases the likelihood that they will get in trouble with the meds. Whereas when they take other drugs, they're not under care of physician. Um, and so that's where we come in with education. But there are some people who take uh, drugs who are not under the care of physician, and they have a tremendous amount of education. Uh, 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 but in general, we want people to be educated and carefully watched so they don't get in trouble. Um, but we don't want to oversell what these medications do. And that's one of the things that we do. We oversell. And people tend to think of them as cures or they're fixing some chemical imbalance. And that just simply is not true. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely, man, I, you know, we're definitely sold that we're, we're about the only country that allows the commercial of the cloud to follow you around and ask you 80 different things. If you, if this happens to you and basically it's like, are you human? Yeah, I, I match all that. I mean, you now also doctors and physicians themselves too are tend to be the easy targets, but they're held to these insurance standards to where they have to treat the person. You know, my wife is an ARMP in the ER. So when they're coming in asking, sometimes you can see the drug seeking behavior, et cetera. But, you know, many times they have a duty to treat. And so if they don't, they can get, you know, injured on the back end. And a big thing that's happening is now, you know, nurses, doctors, et cetera, are being kept on or upgraded by patient customer review, if you will. So if you don't give them what you know you shouldn't, you get the bad review, which on the back end then lowers your status at the hospital. You, you know what I mean? It's like that way in education, I think, turning that way in academia is. But, you know, that's it's, everyone's kind of trapped in this in this maze, you know, rather than just a target of it. What would you say is the, I don't know, the root cause of this kind of entire eruption, if you will? I, I don't know exactly. But I, I think what, what you're saying is that there are people who come to the ER seeking certain types of drugs. And they must give the, the I mean, the, the physicians must prescribe, otherwise they get a bad rating. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, ju I'm just not aware of that sort of thing. I mean, because uh, there are so many things going on there. I mean, on the one hand, it's like, uh, what's wrong with people getting the drugs that they want on the one hand? There you go. And then on the other hand, if people get in trouble with those drugs, like partic particularly we think about opioids, and now the physicians are vilified for that sort of thing. And so they, they are caught in this sort of catch-22. Um, yeah, so that, it, it, that whole sit, everybody's set up in that system. That's not a good system. Um, but that's what I've been trying to, 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 to get the country to think about. It's like, on the one hand, it's like some people want opioids uh, because they help them for whatever reason. Why not make sure those people have opioids and make sure that we have people who are responsible and know what they're doing in terms of prescribing them? Now, let's just now and people say, well, we have that in this country. We don't. Um, so let's think about like other countries that do. Let's think about uh, Switzerland, for example. In Switzerland, uh, people who are who ident who are been that identified as heroin addicts meeting DSM criteria for heroin addiction, um, they can have the choice of receiving the opiate of their choice that they wanted to receive for treatment, whether it's heroin to methadone to morphine or something else. They go and they get their heroin, for example, what they inject. They want a heroin injection. They get heroin injections twice a day. Uh, every day. They see a psychiatrist, they see an internist, they see a social worker, they have all of these sorts of things uh, at their disposal. And most of the people in this program this throughout the country are working, but they're taking heroin every day. And there is little judgment about their heroin use, but they are happier, they're safe, and they're taking large doses of heroin. We're talking, it's, um, in many cases, on average, a thousand milligrams a day. That's a gram a day. You're ha you're lucky if you uh, buy some heroin in New York City 
on the streets and get 25, 50 milligrams in, 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 uh, of heroin when they have a thousand a day, pure heroin. So that that's a model that works for the Swiss people. Yeah. And that's a model that uh, they have no interest in changing because it's working. Can you imagine in the United States where people can go and get the opioid of their choice and um, make sure it's pure and it's also regulated by physicians and so on. So the physicians in Switzerland don't feel this pressure that we have here uh, and they're prescribing heroin. Mm -hmm. And so, so it tells us or it tells me that we're doing something wrong in this country and we are doing something wrong in this country in part because we have inappropriately vilified opiates and heroin and those sorts of things. Now, as a responsible country, we should be, we should be concerned about heroin related deaths and we certainly are. Uh, but the problem is, is that what we are attributing to heroin re related deaths and opioid related deaths may not be heroin and opiate related only death. And so many of the people who die from heroin overdoses and opioid overdoses, they also have other sedatives on board. Um, and they also, and now we, the purity varies so much, like sometimes people get fentanyl, which is a, a, high, a, lot, a lot more potent uh, opioid than heroin or any other opioid. And so uh, given the variability of potency and given the, the mixing of other sedatives, all of this sort of stuff people just don't know. This is where our attention should be focused, making sure that the heroin is, or the opioid is what we think it is on number one, and making sure that people understand that they should not combine large doses of opioids with large doses of benzodiazepines, for example, or other sedatives like alcohol. I mean, these are the kinds of things we have to change in terms of the way we educate people and the way that we make sure that uh, the opioid is uh, what we say it is. Yeah, I hate to be Captain Obvious and go back to it seems like the day, you know, when war was declared on basically addiction and drugs. That seems to be like the root when we begin to vilify a natural human behavior based on a natural occurring substance of what 80 to 90 percent of the population does at one point without full effectiveness. I mean, it seems like that that's where it started. Well, yeah, um, but when we, we think about uh, where we started regulating drugs, we have to go back to the early 1900s, late 1800s. That's when we really started to uh, uh, regulate these drugs. But 1914 wa was the year of the first national drug law. Um, and so some people mark that as the beginning of the drug war. And that's when we regulated cocaine and opioids. And of course we regulated those drugs, not so much because of their pharmacology, but because they were as associated, their use was associated with undesired groups. Cocaine was associated with black people. Opioids were associated with the Chinese who had come over to work on the railroads. And, um, and we, that, that's the playbook that we have been playing off of since 1914. Yeah, to go back, actually, um, where you actually changed, you know, I, I said it a lot, where you changed how I approached what I did when I was in the treatment facilities treating people. This vilification, if you will, came from me from ideas of Suboxone, uh, heroin. You know, I vilified them the way I was taught to and what I had seen on the streets that I came from. And it just everybody knew if you were selling that, if that's what you were buying, that's the road you went down. It was uh, a lot more meth, actually, kind of in the back area. But. You know, so, you know, seeing that I, I changed that way when I started listening more to you of going, OK. And then when I started presenting, presenting it that way in groups, in the therapy sessions, talking about, look, it's not about the abstinence. It's not about a powerless feeling. It's, let's adapt to a human nature. Let's not vilify it. I mean, it was I mean, I, I don't know how many times I got called up front to be told that I was not sticking to how I'm supposed to treat people in this cookie cutter form. Yeah. Um yeah, no, it's good that you um, uh, start to really think and question these sorts of things. And um, one of the things about those groups, uh, I ran groups uh, when, particularly when I first started out, 
and it, it became clear that we were focusing on irrelevant behaviors. And the irrelevant behavior was whether you're clean or not. You know, I don't really give a shit. What I care about is that you behave in a way that's appropriate for a member in our society. That's all I care about. Now, what, what you have in your urine, that's less important to me. But I do care that you treat this person with respect, you handle your responsibility, all of those things. Those are relevant behaviors. Now, if we can get the focus on relevant behaviors, um, then we're, we're, we're doing something. But it's much easier to focus on urine. It's much easier to focus on those sorts of things, in part because it pretends that we're doing something. It pretends that we care, that we're concerned. And we have to also remember there are a lot of people making a lot of money off of urine testing and those sorts of things. And so uh, they are really invested in us continuing to do those urine tests even though they tell you virtually nothing. Because, for example, marijuana will stay in your urine for two to four weeks. Uh, and cocaine will stay in your urine for two days. Um, and that's what, uh, But what does that tell you? And it tells you nothing about level of intoxication. Um, um, uh, and so if you want to know about level of intoxication, you might have to actually do an assessment and look at somebody carefully. Uh, evaluate them. You you might have to actually know some, as opposed to just reading positive or negative. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, on the in those entries, since you were in the groups like I was in those treatment places, when I you know would do a biopsychosocial or talk to somebody or try to get to know them and be rushed. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get you know let's get get them in. And I'm kind of going, but it's been like 45 minutes. How am I supposed to truly get into somebody's background and? I, I'll get to the, the kind of question is I, I talk about sometimes it's some physicians call me if I'm out of line here, you know, just tell me if I'm out of line. All right. <laughs> In one of my rampages, I have uh, one. I said that the dope boys left the corner and put on white coats. No, absolutely. And, and the second one that I get a lot of shit for is I, I said that a physician prescribing antidepressants is practically practicing out of his scope. Um, I, um, I don't know, you know, it, it, certainly some are because you can have some general practitioners doing that sort of thing and they don't, and they're not uh, trained in psychiatry. They're not trained in those sorts of things. You certainly can. Uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, your sort of view in terms of, um, uh, the physician as the sort of drug dealer in some respect, um, that certainly is true at some level. And, you know, at some level, we want them to be our drug dealers because uh, that was they, up there for me, man. That was your chance. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, because, you know, you have drugs that we know the quality uh, and you got somebody who's kind of watching over what you're doing. Great. Um, so I, I, I don't. Um, I'm certainly not against physicians prescribing psychoactive medications. It's a great thing. I mean, I, frankly, uh, I would be a lot less happier person if I didn't have my psychoactive drugs. And so I want to make sure people use it. Exactly. I want to make sure people have them and can use them um, in ways that enhance their functioning. Yeah, for, you know, I, I keep referencing, I keep, sorry, I keep personalizing or uh, what do they call it? Counter-transference here, but uh, I'm not in the room anymore. Um, you know, that, that was the big change for me too, is I think where I changed my fight is I used to talk about being a, a uh, addiction activist and I changed the wording that I used to treatment activist after I really started to ingest what you're talking about, what you teach, what you, what you show. And as I would prefer that too, that they're wearing white coats and helping people. And but what we're not doing, I think, now is currently meeting them on the back end with the actual help and the you know environmental, the biological, even the mental. We're not meeting that other side. But it's like here's an open gate. The getting them from the right people. It's been tested. Here's your clinics. But here's twelve. You know, I don't want to bash it because it works. But you know what I mean. No, I feel you. No, I mean, uh, well, we can talk about 12 steps. I mean, and, and AA, the AA model, I think it's a great model for uh, social interactions, helping people to make connections. I, I always loved that when I was doing those kind of groups. Um, 
people would talk about their kids or were at school and vac uh, vaccinations, all of those sorts of things. And it was great. Uh, now, it was, it was great for that sort of social interaction. But when it came to drugs, that's not what that's not what they do. That's not what that. And so people shouldn't get it twisted. Uh, much of what they say about drugs is just flat out wrong. I mean, and 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 so we have to understand that just because they're wrong about much of what they say, like once an addict, always an addict; once an alcoholic. All, I mean, that's just like there's no evidence for that rubbish. But that's but. That doesn't mean that we should throw the whole model out because there is a lot about the model that I think is useful. I mean, it's important, like I teach at a university and that we have these students here. They have their socialization, their social interactions here. There are a number of people who don't have that sort of thing and that sort of AA model provides it. That's great. I don't want to take away that. Um, it's just that I have a problem with what they say about drugs, mostly of what, what they say about drugs, but, but that's okay. Uh, we can actually improve the model, but I don't, I don't think people are really willing to improve the model, but that's okay. Um, um, what else? I'm There's sorry. Even, no worries. There's even a divide in within the model between NA and AA about what approach is supposed to work for it. So I'm, I'm with you. I like the social, the re-socialization model of it aspect, but you're right. There always seems to be this, this is my team, that's your team, rather than, hey, neuroscience, let's get on board with uh, nutritionists. Let's get on board with environmentalists and behavioralists and cognitive. Let's, let's stop fighting our own schools and just saying, what do you got? What do you got? And, and let's you know, meet that other side. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because, yeah, uh, we we agree, and I think a number of people would agree with that perspective. Uh, but when you start talking about the nuts and bolts of it, it becomes more problematic uh, because it's complicated. It's complicated in that it requires people to uh, know more than their own uh, sort of expertise. It it it, it requires them to. Um, consider these things that are that are not easy you know it's kind of easy to give somebody a pill but it's a lot more difficult to make sure someone has a job and the skills for that job make sure that people understand how um, uh, to um, uh, take uh, uh, to negotiate societies it's a lot more complicated uh, than simply just saying Oh, it's your dopamine. You know, it's a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, I I aim or hope for a future of kind of change like that, you know, um, about changing the way we even treat just mental health itself. You know, what is from a more of a front front end, I guess, in the trenches standpoint, sometimes I even get bugged at myself that I say I bring awareness to this shit. I mean, how does someone actually go beyond the bringing the awareness to it and really bring change uh, at within a state level, a, a whatever, a, a global level, how does someone go beyond doing that? Yeah, you know, it's one of these things that I'm trying. I'm I'm struggling with that that question every day. Um, and so, as I think about how what I try to do, I try to write uh, for the scientific literature. I try to write for the popular literature. I try to make sure I give talks into a wide range of audiences, particularly the popular sort of audience, people who are not experts in this area. Um, because if you educate the folks who are not experts in this area, they are the people who vote, they put pressure on their politicians, their ele ele elected officials. Um, I think that's what a real change happens with the people, the people who are voting. Um, like people say, should we talk to politicians? Politicians are a waste of fucking time. They're, they're not the people who we should talk to. They are the people who the, the public should put pressure on. The public do put pressure on those people. But me, as someone trying to um, uh, educate, inform people, uh, it's not the politician. It is the people who are just trying to make it. People who are... Uh, just regular folk like us, and um, they vote. Those, those are the, so. If we can get them the message, help them understand the message, the message in simple terms. Um, that's I think that's where the action is. Oftentimes, though, we fail to get the message to them in terms that they understand. In part because we ourselves don't understand it as well, and so we can't communicate it to people uh, in ways that they clearly get. 
And so I'm trying to get better at communing, communicating to people who are not experts. They are the, they are the true people that, that we need to reach. That, that mass, I think we were touching briefly in the beginning about exercising or being able to, from a research standpoint to a personal standpoint, exercise some humility and self-questioning of, you know, what we believe, you know, just like I had to, I mean, you forced it down my throat though, but I had no choice but to go, wait, just be off heroin and just, you know, <laughs> and then I had to go, oh shit, you know, I was a part of that system and it, but it, it took that, you know, I had to feel stupid for a while as I still do sometimes, but you know, that change, but a lot of people aren't willing to say they don't know or the help isn't there. You know, we want to think that the right help is there. But I mean, I think maybe the education part, have you seen some of the things online about what they allow into these schools for so-called drug education? No, you know, I really try to avoid this. You know, I have kids. I have a kid who is in school, a 15 year old. And um, I have a 16 year old daughter, man. I'm with you. 16 year old. Yeah. So I have to hear about it uh, periodically and then I have to voice my objections at his school or he does the voicing of of the objection. Uh, But I, I, you know, I uh, obviously we all knew about D.A.R.E. and some of the rubbish that happened uh, 10, 20 years ago. Um, But I suspect it's still happening. Um, uh, So uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to call that stuff out. But it's just. When we think about the educating of children with drugs, uh, oftentimes it's used to shut down a conversation. And we treat these kids as if they are non-thinking beings, and that's just simply not true as we know and when we really think about it. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't looked much at the drug education of children these days. No, don't, don't. There's guys in clown suits, man, showing up. Ta- uh, it's... It- there's almost no standard county by county and throughout the country. So they, at least they're trying new things. I'll give them that, you know, at least they're trying, but you know, I, it is an aim possibly for education to try to find the gold standard or is it more or less try to find a way that, that fits in with, you know, the, the, the school or the, the age group. I mean, is it, do we take like a Marzano approach to developing drug education or do we just force feed a, another, you know, one size fits all format? What, I mean, well, I think drug education become more holistic, and so it's not so it's not about education. It's about you just having the, the, the right perspective, the perspective that we value, and it's not about uh, thinking about drugs like we think about math or like we think about some other subject. Um, it's a subject that's kind of on its own. It's like we just want you to share this view. Just say no, basically not to think about this. If you think about this, then you will see that we're full of shit. (laughs) Well, that I think, you know, I've been, uh, I've had my moments of pontification, Uh, sometimes not the most fun guy to have at a party, but, you know, I've announced that, you know, you create this, uh, forgive me here, man, this preacher daughter syndrome, I know, send me the emails, but you create this syndrome of it's bad, you could die, if you hit weed once, you're gonna, your life's over, and then I think then the kids, A, have Google now, which makes them 10 times smarter than we ever were and are now, that they can now research the bullshit, but then if they experience something, and what they've been lied to doesn't happen, I psychologically, how can't that push a want to explore more, which would be naturally anyway? You know, it's almost like the, go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah, I mean, when we think about like Google, for example, they do have more opportunity for the good information, but they also have opportunity for bad information. There's so much crap that they can Google and they do. And so the the problem is, is that, uh, again, how do they evaluate this information? And that's one of the things that schools should be doing, teaching them how to sift out the rubbish from the good stuff. But they're not getting that in school on the one hand. That's that, and that's a problem. And, and so... Uh, uh, um, um, you mean critically think, Doc? You, we, we want them to critically think and not robotically raise hands before spoken, get in line, sit still, pull up your chair... I mean, come on. I mean, we're, you know, <laughs> sorry for the little head. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I have given talks at high schools uh, over the past few years. And, um, and whenever I've given talks at these high schools, the people who invite me, you know, there's some well, trepidation and there's some concern that they may 
uh, not be popular among their peers because they're inviting me because I'm going to talk about uh, the problem isn't drugs. There are other issues, and um, you've been lied to about. Tell the students they've been lied to about drugs, and 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 if you if you're saying these things, like think uh, about this, you uh, in a in a way that you would think about other problems, and then it's interpreted as you encouraging these young people to use drugs simply because you're telling them to think, and and and, and of course that's. Uh, that's absurd and that's inappropriate and that's uh, antithetical to education. Of course, all of those things are true, but uh, 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 people still get away with saying that somebody like me is encouraging young people to do drugs. And of course, I have my own young people and I don't want them to get in trouble with drugs or any of these things. It, it would cause me great concern. Uh, but by that same token, it would cause me even more concern if my kids didn't have the information. Yeah, I, you know, I have, uh, I speak in a, a few schools, very small level, very tiny stuff. And I got my first invite to talk to a thousand kids. And frankly, I'm, uh, I don't know, they still make me a little nervous, you know, because you're reaching out to them. And in a way, I visited with them once trying to say, give me some topics you want to know about. And then it ended up linking me with their safe coordinator to talk about drugs, if you will. So, as I'm walking in here, maybe give me a what not to say <laughs> and maybe uh, something to kind of focus on that's worked for you or something I could, you know, let me, let me hijack a little something from you, man. <laughs> Help me out here. Yeah, you know, like um, we talk about kids and drug use and we talk about all the concerns about these drugs. We have conducted national surveys for on, on, on kids' drug use, high school drug use since 1975, so 40 years now. And we have good data. And the data tells us that the, the drugs that uh, kids in high school are more likely to use are alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. And those other drugs, cocaine, you name it, acid, whatever, small, small percentage of kids will use those drugs in high school. There are some, but it's a very small percentage. Since that's the case, it seems like Drug education should focus on those drugs primarily, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. How do we keep kids safe? Because if the kid themselves are not using those drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, maybe they have friends. And maybe they can help their friends if their friends get in trouble with those kinds of things. And so we, I just go down the line and talk about what are the potential harms associated with those drugs and how to avoid those harms and how to enhance uh, the the uh, the positive or decrease the likelihood of them getting in trouble. That's the sort of major focus, and that's realistic, and that is practical, helpful. Yeah, it's almost like be more afraid of the law than what may happen to you by trying a drug one time. That's almost what you fear more, you know, these days than than really feeling, you know, smoke a little bit of weed or whatever. Depends, but, depends on who you are. That's right. The law will be. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, it can it can be terrifying. So, you know, introducing that those ideas, I, I love. I'm sure they know what to expect when you book a guy on the cognitive rampage. <laughs> it's gonna be a gonna be a little edgy, I think, at at some point. Um, you know, I'm bringing in that education to them, and I like walking on that that ground. And I'll I'll keep it there. Well, when you say cognitive rampage, maybe they think that oh yeah, he's gonna tell us something about the brain and <laughs> what happens when we're angry. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit. That's about all I can go, man. I got one little video that talks about it, but just on my, uh, in my lane, not on the neuroscience lane. Yeah. It, what, I, am I even close with the anger video about it having a neurological reaction similar to fear? Uh, uh, maybe it does. Yeah. I'm, I don't know. It's not my area, but I'm sure that, you know, when we think about the brain, it's always active and, um, we can say, any kind of shit and be accurate about the brain, uh, particularly what we've done with neural imaging. It's so frustrating. But anyway, that's that's my rampage. <laughs> oh, man, shit. Your rampage has been going for a while. That's the best way to end this podcast. Man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, it's a dream come true for me. Check that shit off the list, man. Th thank you. And uh, I'll keep sharing everything that you do and keep up the fight, man. Thank you. And good to talk to you, man. And good luck and continue doing your thing. Uh, oh, you know, by the way, I always mention every time I'm posting that, um, you know, you're quoted in, in my book, The Cognitive Rampage. And it's 
trusting your cognitive plasticity or your cognitive flexibility and trusting in that is, is a quote that I, I use. One of the quotes, you're in there a few times, but that's the phrase, man, that, uh, that really hit me in that speech that you gave too. Right on. Thank you, bro. I will be seeing you and checking you out. Yeah, I just got all fandom and shit, man. It just got weird. <laughs> oh, oh my God. well i'm transparent on this motherfucker man so that's how i get down man you know how, you know how we do it in florida man <laughs> i haven't been there in a minute but yeah <laughs> too hot man don't come right now it's too hot down here right now it's yeah. too it's terrible, man. So, will you, you know, will you do this again, man? Will you come on again and, and chat? Yeah, just, just hit me up, man. Absolutely. You got my number, so hit me up. Call me. I don't do emails well, but hit me up. I will, man. I, I appreciate it again, Doc. Thank you. All right. Take care, man.